Hi, this is Amy Plum, and I am here today on February 3rd on the book birthday of my new digital novella, Die Once More. This is part of the Die For Me series, of which um, the first three books are Die For Me, Until I Die, and If I Should Die. And then following those are two digital novellas from Jules point of view uh, called Die For Her and now, as of today, Die Once More. Uh, so to celebrate, I thought I would read to you uh, from chapter of 11 of this 100-page uh, novella. Um, and in this scene, Jules is driving Ava, who is a revenant from New York, um, from Paris, from La Maison, to Brittany to see Bran. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start. Chapter 11. We drive for the first hour in silence, Ava flipping through the radio stations until we get too far from Paris to get anything but static, and then changing to the iPod Ambrose gave us. His playlists are full of jazz. Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald scat and sing and croon while we drive with the windows down. Ava's head is tilted back, eyes closed, as she breathes in the fresh morning air of the countryside. But after a while, the non-communication gets old, and I feel like talking. Ava hasn't said a word since we left. Finally, I turn the music down. So, where are you from, I ask. Are you making conversation? Ava responds, amusement twinkling in her eyes. Yes, I suppose I am, I reply. In fact, I'm the driver and you're the drivee, which means you're responsible keep for keeping me entertained. Uh, there's the music, she says. An hour of jazz is quite enough for me. Thank you. So back to the question, where are you from? She was hoping to brush me off and my insistence bothers her. She raises her eyebrows defiantly. I don't see why I have to tell you my life story. And I don't see why you've been acting like I'm your own personal public enemy number one since the moment you laid eyes on me. Wow, I didn't mean to say that. Ava squeezes her eyes shut and pinches the top of her nose. She breathes in and out and says, I'm from Long Island. I mean your family, I prod. Where are they from? She stares at me. You mean you want to know what race I am? Now I'm afraid. I know about this political correctness thing in the States and never know which terms are currently acceptable and which will get you slapped. What I want to know was the origin of the glowing copper skin, the thick black flowing hair that frames her face, the almond shapes, uh, uh, shaped eyes that are, I pull my gaze from the road to her face for a second, an extraordinary tone between brown and dark green. I wanted to know what factors merged to give her such an original beauty, but something tells me not to compliment her, so I play it safe. Well, that wasn't exactly the way I was thinking about it, but sure, race, I respond carefully. Why not? She gapes at me for a count and then bursts out laughing. Okay, then one grandma is African-American, the other grandpa, oh, one grandpa Cherokee. He must be the white foot in your name, I say, and she nods. And my mom's side is Dutch, Scottish, Irish. I think there's even a French Huguenot in there. I am the American melting pot, she says, with not a little bit of pride. You're New York, I murmur. What? she asks. Nothing. We ride in silence for a while while I savor the information she's given me. It's been a long time since I've had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a woman that didn't consist of logistics and rescuing a human. And I've forgotten how the give and take feeds me. Every tidbit she offers is like honey, a piece of herself especially from this woman who gives nothing away, at least to me, which reminds me. So why do you hate me? I ask. Her lightheartedness disappears, only to be replaced by the habitual coldness. Not quite as glacial as before, I note, but it would still qualify as refrigerated. I don't hate you, she says, sighing. I just hate your type. My type? I huff, and just what that would be. What, what would that be? A rake, a scoundrel, she responds. Now, just a moment, I say, hitting the button on my door to roll up the windows. I need to hear this. What are you talking about? As I've said before, your reputation precedes you, Ava says, and now all the warmth is gone. 
Her arms are crossed and she's as closed as a safe. I think back to the council meeting where I saw her first. Is this about what Harlem Riots guy said about me seducing half of London at the last convocation? That was just one of the plethora of stories I had already heard. Plethora? You heard a plethora of stories about me? I ask, voice raised. Showgirls, politicians, even a princess from what I heard, she replies crisply. No one is immune from the wiles of Jules Marche Noir. I pull the car to the side of the road, put it in park, and unstrap my seatbelt so that I can face her. Okay. For one thing, you Americans have way too much time on your hands, or way too little happening in your own country, if all you have to discuss is the love lives of your foreign kindred. She shrugs. The French have always fascinated us, I admit. Especially those who live up to all the worst stereotypes. All the worst? I exclaim. Just what the... I feel like I'm choking. I'm so angry. Water? Ava says coolly, and she hands me a bottle of, of Evian from the bag she packed. I take it, twist off the top, guzzle half of it, and then pour some in my hand and splash it in my face. I don't care if I get Ambrose's leather upholstery wet. I need to cool down. Better? Ava asks with a grin. Stop it with the smugness, I say. And she gives me a look like she just won the grand prize for getting under my skin. I take a deep breath and say, Okay, first of all, I'm not a rake. I have never treated a woman disrespectfully. I have never lied, cheated, or misled a woman about my intentions or commitment. Yes, I have seen a lot of women in my life, but I have treated them all impeccably, made them each feel like royalty, including the princess, and made sure that each of them, every one, thought that it was her choice not to see me again. I have a very hard time believing that, Ava says, eyes narrowed. Ask my kindred. Hell, ask the ladies in question, those who are still alive. I have no doubt in my mind that each and every one of them would remember me with fondness, and maybe even with pity at breaking my heart. Ava is silent. Besides, why the hell do you care, I say with raised voice. Are you some kind of feminist crusader who has to protect your poor hapless sisters from the evil wiles of men? Trust me, Ava, the women I've known have not been weak. I have preyed on no one. They've all been as strong as me, if not stronger. There's a look on her face that I can't interpret. A look of hurt and pride and defensiveness all at once. And then suddenly I understand. Something bad has happened to you. Yes, she responds. Okay. There's your excerpt. That's not the whole chapter. But we're already going on eight minutes here, so I think that's probably long enough. Um, I hope you enjoyed it enough to actually order the um, the ebook. It is called Die Once More. Uh, it's available wherever you get ebooks. And um, you can download it in an instant today, um, February 3rd, 2015. Thanks so much.